Hello, my name is Ethan Woods, and today we're going to be talking about something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is flintlocks, and what you need to get started into this wonderful hobby. Now, before we get too far into this, I'm just going to give you a little backstory of my experience with flintlocks. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not a expert on this matter, really. Uh, I've got about a little over a year's experience, and one of the cool things about flintlocks is every day is a new learning experience. I've got so many people, helpful people in the comment sections who are letting me know about books or letting me know about this or that and you learn all sorts of new stuff. And There's a lot to learn with flintlocks and we're going to get started with some of that today. But before we get started, I want to tell you the story of how I got started into flintlocks. I've been handling firearms ever since I was probably four years old whenever my dad first handed me a 12 gauge shotgun and let me try it out and it knocked me right on my rear the first time I shot it. But I've always been enthralled with firearms and as a younger, as a younger man, as a kid, every time a, a new gun would come into the house it would be so exciting. You were learning all sorts of new stuff about it. We didn't really have internet so you would be reading books up on it and you would just mess around with it and you'd figure out all these neat little things that the gun would do. And as years went on, you'd get so many, we got so many guns that it just kind of lost its, it just kind of lost its, um, the magic to it, you know. You start learning about pretty much everything there is to know about modern firearms. And I'm not saying I'm a know-it-all, but I know quite a bit about modern firearms. And, you know, it's just, there's nothing new. The magic's kind of gone. And they just, yeah, it just kind of, it's still fun, but it's not what it used to be. Well, here a little over a year ago, uh, I made, I started this channel, and it was just mainly to be a gun channel, you know, just, I was going to make a few videos and call it good and show, show them to my friends, but then there was a video we made a while ago, and we actually filmed two videos together the same day. The first video was on the Steyr AUG rifle, which I was really excited about and I had just got it, hadn't really shot it, I just barely zeroed it and that was pretty much it. I was really excited to shoot it and I got out and I made that video and I shot the AUG and lo and behold it was another semi-automatic rifle pretty much it. It was kind of kind of interesting but you know it was overpriced in my opinion and yeah it didn't really do it for me. But then there was another gun that we brought out. It was just the secondary gun we were going to shoot that day. And that was this gun right here. Now I had done a little reading up on it beforehand and I got a lot of things wrong in that video as far as history goes. But uh, I, I went out there and we were going to shoot this video. I was like, I've never shot a flintlock before. I'm really excited to do it. So we got it all loaded up. My little brother who had been shooting it for a week or two beforehand showed me how. Got her all loaded up there. Didn't have any round ball just had bird shot and I went out there and that very first time you see me shoot that flintlock or this flintlock in that video was the very first time I had ever fired a flintlock and I think I even mentioned it in the video I was like you know today we got something that's probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen I think this is the quote I actually said in that video I don't know I might put a clip of that right here so today we're gonna talk about a not a rifle but a gun that it's just about one of the coolest things I've ever seen. It was. It really was. And immediately, all the old magic of learning new stuff about guns was all back. And I was so excited. And that summer, I pretty much did nothing but shoot flintlocks. And I've pretty much been shooting flintlocks ever since, all the time. So, yeah. That's my story of how I got started with flintlocks. They are a lot of fun. Great learning experience. But anyhow, let's get started with this video. I know that was a long intro, but... So what do you need to get started into flintlock shooting? I'm going to try to keep this sweet and simple. Well, the first thing you're going to need is a flintlock. Now, there are several different ways you can go with this, but to make it quick and simple, the first route is the rifle. Now, I'm not really very well versed in this one. I messed with some, but... Yeah, yeah, I haven't done a whole lot with them. And the reason is, is because there's essentially two different qualities you can get with rifles. You can get the pre-built, usually like the Traditions and CVAs, 
stuff like that, and they're usually pretty cheap, but they're not exactly historically accurate, and some of the some of the workmanship can be a little a little uh, hit or miss. Um, and then there's on the other side of the spectrum where you got the custom builds like Kibblers and all of those, some of the ones from Track of the Wolf and whatnot, and the originals, not to even mention those, but those are really pretty historically accurate, you know, the originals are because, you know, they're original, but <laughs> the Kibbler stuff like that, they can be really historically accurate. Problem is, is you got to have a lot of experience going into it because you've got to build them, and it's a real build. Like, I want to build one one of these days, but I do not feel like I am ready just yet. That's why I'm doing a Fusey de Chasse or a Fusey Thin build right now to get practiced up on it. I'm going to eventually, but just not right now. And the other reason why I haven't gotten into it is they are super expensive. Like we're talking hmm, $1,500, $1,600 for a kit. So yeah, I want to go down that road eventually, just not exactly right now. Maybe one of these days I'll get one of them Southern Mountain Rifle kits or a Saudi Daisy. That would be really fun. But anyhow, so that's the rifles. And I, I really wouldn't suggest you start there. I would suggest you start with a smoothbore. Now there's several ways you can go with a smooth bore too. You can go the route that we mostly have here and what we started out with, which is the military style smooth bores. So the fun thing about military guns is that when you get one, there's a whole lot of manuals and load data for paper cartridges. And there's so much material that you can find to make these as historically accurate as you can. And Thanks to places like Military Heritage, Veteran Arms, uh, Middlesex Village, websites like that, you can get Indian-made replicas for a very, very budget-friendly price. So, for all of you out there who are saying, oh, those are Bombay pipe bombs and they're made out of scrap metal and they're so low quality they're going to blow up in your face. Well, I'll just tell you right here, old Char here, my 1766 Charlottesville, and it is a 66. I have put over a thousand rounds through this very gun, most of them with a 150 grain charge of 1.5F with a 60 or 6, excuse me, a 0 0.648 to a 60 caliber lead round ball and I've had no issues with this gun blowing up or bulging or anything, and it's actually surprisingly accurate. Now, I will say that some of these Indian-made guns, the fit and finish can be a little uh, iffy. The main problem I have with them is the wooden ramrods. Wooden ramrods tend to like to break. They'll do new ramrod. It's not that hard. It's a lot of fun. Matter of fact, we got a wooden ramrod in this double barrel here, which brings me to my next group of guns, which is civilian muskets and shotguns. Now this is a double barrel shotgun or really just a double barrel musket. And this is where I'm starting to lean towards nowadays. I'm really getting into the Fowlers and stuff like that, like the Fusies. Uh, we got a Fusie de Chasse. It's being worked on right now. It's being rebuilt into a Fusie Fin. Uh, we have a Northwest Trade Gun. A lot of fun, a lot of fun there. But yeah, these are the civilian guns. They're, they're a lot of fun too. And they're, once again, a whole different loading system. You've now gone from patched balls to paper cartridges for the, the muskets, the military muskets, patched balls for the civilian rifles and military rifles. And now you get into civilian smoothbores and you're getting things like wasp nest and cards and um, felt wads, things like that. And it's a lot of fun. They are, they are probably the most fun out of all of these, in my opinion. So yeah, that's where, if that's a lot to handle, I know that's, that's quite a bit, but the first thing you're going to need is you're going to need a musket. Now, the second thing you're going to need is ammunition. It's not like when you just go and buy a cartridge for a cartridge gun, and you just buy that round, or even percussion guns. The flintlock musket, or rifle, generally has at least three different styles of, well not styles, three different um, steps to loading and three different components. So the first component we're going to talk about is you're going to need yourself some powder. And I got some horns out here and 
yeah, you're gonna need powder. That's the main thing you're gonna need because even if you don't have the other, well, there's another component you gotta have, we'll get to in just a second, but you need powder. And when I say you need powder, I mean black powder. Do not load these guns with smokeless powder. If you don't know what smokeless powder is, you need to go and figure that out. I don't know how to explain it better to you. It's what's used in modern ammunition. You need to go, probably I would suggest going to Graf and Sons and getting yourself some Go-X or some, mm, some uh, Graf and Sons powder. They have their own. Schuston's good. Swiss is good. Old Einsford, all these different kinds of black powders. Get real black powder. Another one you want to stay away from is Pyrodex. And this is the stuff you see sold at Cabela's and places like that as black powder. It's not. It's a black powder substitute. I want to do a test on it because I guarantee you I know what the result's going to be. But I haven't gotten proof of it yet. Pyrodex has a much, much different burn rate. Let's just say it that way. It's, it takes a much higher um, temperature to ignite it. And when you put it in your pan of your flintlock, I would say you get maybe one round out of ten is actually going to light it off. And when it does light off, it just slowly sits there and burns away like a fuse in the pan for about three or four seconds, and then it goes off, if it does. But what I'd like to test sometime is I do believe that Pyrodex is dirtier and it is highly corrosive. I can't tell you how many times as a kid with my old inline musket, or not musket, inline rifle, that I would shoot Pyrodex and if you didn't clean it within probably two or three hours, you had a lot of rust on there real bad. Black powder, you can get a little get away with a little better, but I, I think it's more corrosive than Pyrodex is. So yeah, get yourself some good black powder. All right, now let's talk about the the uh, second thing you're going to need is you're going to need, you've got your fuel, you're going to need your ignition. Well, these are flint locks, so you're going to need to get yourself some flints, and you're going to have to get the right size. Now, I'm just going to make this easy for you as a beginner. You can measure the cock and this, for future reference, this isn't a hammer, this is the cock. This is the hammer right there, that's the hammer, or the steel. You can measure the cock and do it that way, or you can just go to Track of the Wolf and go and find your musket in the flint section in the Tom Fuller Nap Flints. Don't get the saw cuts. Get the Tom Fuller Nap Flints. Find your musket and then just order it for your musket. Easiest way to do it. When you get better at this sort of stuff, you can eventually start napping your own flints. I've done some of that. It's a lot of fun. You can get some really cool flints out of that. So, yeah, you're going to need some flints. And the last thing, well, not even the last thing, I guess there's four steps to this and four different components. You're also going to need the ball. Now, there's several different ways you can go with this. First, you're going to have to find out what uh, size ball you actually need. For instance, this brown vest here is a 75 caliber, but it takes a 69 caliber ball. This Charleville, it's a 69 caliber, but it's supposed to take a 63 caliber ball. However, nobody makes one that I can find. If you guys can point me to a good place to get some 63 calibers, I'll be more than happy to take them. But uh, the closest I can get is some 648s from Track of the Wolf, and then I can't find a mold to cast my own. But uh, yeah, so that's another thing is you can either buy them or you can cast them strongly suggest you get a mold and you figure out how to cast your own lead. We're going to do a video on that and that'll probably be a part of a series we're going to do on getting started with flint locks. So another thing that you're going to need to go with your flint is you're going to need a way of holding it in the jaws of the cock because you can't just put your flint in the jaws. The jaws will tighten down, they'll break it or you'll damage your jaws. You got to have something to kind of cushion it. So either leather or actually a little uh, plate of lead would both be historically accurate and would actually work quite well. And now we're moving on to the last component of what you need for your ammunition. You've got ball, you got powder, and you got flint. Now all you need is some way to keep that ball from rolling out the barrel. I mean we could all just do a sharp and just spit her down the tube, but if you ever point your barrel down the ball's gonna fall out. 
So you're going to need a way of securing it in there. Now if you're going to shoot with a rifle, the best way to do this and the most historically accurate is to use a patch. Or you can use pillow ticking and carry it around in your possibles bag and have a patch knife and cut it out. That's actually the most historical accurate way to do it, I should say. Um, now you can do that with smooth bores too. In the 18th century it wasn't really talked about a whole lot. There's some references in the 1830s and 40s of people doing it with smooth bores, but it really wasn't done in the 18th century, at least not in the first half of the 18th century. For that you would have used a card and it's literally that. It's a piece of paper. And what you do is you fold it in half and you drop your ball down the barrel on the powder and then you put your card on top and you shove the card down on top of the ball holds the ball in. Now some people would say well doesn't that just make that ball rattle around in that barrel and then just go whichever way it wants to go whenever it leaves? Nope. That powder will, I've said it a few times in some videos, but that powder will actually burn, ignite, and it will burn a ring around the ball. It'll have a ring of plasma around the ball holding it steady and it will actually make it more accurate than if you put the card underneath the ball and then put a card on top. Um, there's a bunch of other different methods you can use. I've used green grass. It doesn't light on fire. Um, it holds the ball in pretty good. I made some pretty accurate shots of the green grass. Uh, there's also these little uh, cardboard wads. Now these aren't very historically accurate for the 18th century, but uh, they do a pretty good job. But the thing you're going to see us use the most is wasp nest. And the reason why we use wasp nest is, is it's a pretty, uh, pretty renowned with the old timers for being used because it doesn't catch on fire. And you can find it anywhere. So yeah, there's your uh, wadding for your smooth bores and your patches for your rifles. Now that covers ammunition. Now let's get into the accessories you're going to have to have. And believe you me, there are a lot of them. Once again, this is just the stuff that you need. Like, you'll eventually need all of this stuff. So, let's just start off with the basics and start off with something like the powder horn. Now this horn is my little brother Caleb's and uh, I can't remember exactly where we got this one from. It was uh, We got it off the internet. I think we got it off Etsy. Uh, some guy had made it. Did a really good job. This one's actually got the uh, capability for a powder measure on the end and it's got the little trap like that right there. And then you got some of your more budget friendly horns like this one right here. I've got the cap at my house. Um, these are these are pretty alright to get started out with. This is probably what I'd suggest you get. I have something here to show you guys. Now I'm not going to read it off because I'm going to read this poem that's written on this thing to you guys on Independence Day for our Independence Day video. But this is what my wife got me for my birthday. That is a beautiful horn. It's got all this inscription and everything on it. Once again, tune in on July 4th for that video and you're going to figure out what that says and it's, it's pretty cool. But yeah, you're going to need to get yourself a good horn. Now this is where some people would say, well couldn't I get a flask? Yeah, you could get a flask, but uh, you show up to any flintlock shoot shooting with a flask, they're going to laugh at you because it's not historically accurate whatsoever. And you can only hold about 10 rounds worth of powder in there too. So yeah, get yourself a good horn. Now that we've covered horns, let's go on to the next thing you're going to need as far as tools and accessories go. <clears throat> this little guy right here is worth a lot. Now it doesn't have to be necessarily this. This is a powder measure. Uh, this is one my older brother Garrett made. He made all of us our own powder measures out of deer antler. And uh, you're going to need yourself a good powder measure. Now like I said, you don't have to buy one. You can actually go, it's not historically accurate, but you can use a 12 gauge shotgun shell. You just need something that you can pour your powder in there and then pour down the barrel. Now here's where I'm going to talk about something that I'm very, very religious about, and I know you guys don't think that I am from my videos, but I am. And that is um, the safety, safety with flintlocks. One of the biggest concerns of mine is that if I load down the barrel with a horn, that that powder is going to ignite from an ember in the bottom and it's going to go off and kill me. Because if I load this thing 
Well, I'll just put a video right here of a guy. Uh, I'll put his YouTube name on here, give him the credit. But of this guy who goes and he takes and he actually lights, sees what happens if you put a fuse on a horn and light it. It's a hand grenade. It's literally a hand grenade. So yeah, I, I never load out of the horn right after I shoot. You will see me load out of the horn on occasion, like in our last video, but that was a, I hadn't shot that gun in probably two, maybe three hours. So the chances of there being an ember in the bottom were non-existent. There was no way there was an ember in the bottom of that gun. It was completely safe. But yeah, you definitely need to get yourself a good powder measure. So let's move on to the next thing that you're going to need, and that is some way of sharpening your flint. Because after about 30, 40 rounds, your flint's gonna go dull. Depending on your flint quality, it may even be less than that. So what you're gonna need is something made out of brass. Why do you think we need this that made out of brass? Is because, well, what causes this thing to go off? It's a piece of flint hitting a piece of steel, causing a spark, a piece of that steel getting shaved off, causing a spark and lighting it off. Chances are when you have to sharpen your flint, it's going to be when your gun's loaded. I mean, you'll have no powder in the pan, but still, hitting on a piece of flint with a piece of steel when there's still a touch hole and powder on the other side of that touch hole is pretty dangerous. So, yeah, brass doesn't spark, so get something made out of brass. You can get these little hammers. Uh, I've got one that I'm going to have here. It's pretty simple. It's just a piece of round brass stock with a little step cut in it. So you just set that step on top of the flint, give it a little push, and it'll chip it off. But you can use this brass hammer too, and what you do is you just take your gun, put it on half cock, and then you just take and you strike kind of a 90 degree angle like such, and you chip all that flint off like that, and then this gun is unloaded. Go ahead and test her and see how much spark you get. So, yeah, you're going to need a way of sharpening your flint. Uh, let's see, what other accessory are you going to need? Very important one coming up here. You're going to need a possibles bag. Now, this one here is mine. I got this one from Townsend's and Son. Uh, same people who own the or have the YouTube channel. Awesome channel. I suggest you guys go check it out if you haven't already. Um, this is one I got from them. It's a, it's just a pretty good little possibles bag. I got all my stuff in here. You can see I got felt wads or cardboard wads for the, the fusey. I've got some uh, sinew here. It's a pretty good thing to have. And then I got my powder measure and my leather bullet bag. And then this right here pretty neat little thing and you don't have to have one of these and it's probably not very historically accurate but this right here is a priming tool so all you got to do is you take it and I don't know if I even have any powder left in this thing and you just push down yep sure do and you get a nice little fine bit of powder in there pretty pretty cool little tool now that's not something that you have to have because here lately I've just been priming with the same powder I'm using but and then here I got a flint wallet this is also from Townsend's. Got all my spare flints in there, so if one of them gets completely obliterated, I have more. Uh, got wasp nest, of course. And uh, I got a bunch of ball. And another thing that I'm going to mention that you need to get, a worm. That's what this is. We'll talk about that in the cleaning video, but this is what, something you really need to have to clean your musket. Uh, let's see here, that's about it. Yep, got some ball or got some balls. Got a uh, oh yeah, this is a pretty handy little doodad. This is a borsh or a breech breech plug scraper. Scrape your breech plug when you're, you're cleaning your gun. Once again, we'll talk about that whenever we are doing the cleaning video on how to clean your musket. Another thing you're gonna want is a way of taking your gun apart, and that's gonna be like a screwdriver, like uh, this one here, or if you're not worried about being too historically accurate, you can just use a regular screwdriver. Now then there are, that is the necessities. That is the stuff you have to have to get started. Once you get all that down, once again, 
ball, powder, flint, something to hold your flint in, musket, possible's bag, powder horn, powder, uh, let's see what else, wadding or patch, cleaning supplies. This is the most important stuff that you have to have. Once you have that down, then you can move to stuff like, you know, have yourself some sinew and, uh, you know, get yourself a little priming tool. And, uh, you know, I even have stuff like this haversack here. Once you start going down this rabbit hole, as you can see from right now, by the way I'm dressed, there's no coming back. Like, it is addicting, and it's kind of expensive. But then that's not all. Once you've gotten the guns, the accessories, the ammunition, the supplies to make your own ammunition, uh, tools, and all sorts of stuff like that, well, then you got to get some more accessories, because, you know, it's not just guns that you had in the 18th century. No, no, then you got to get some bayonets which we don't have any yet, but we will be getting some here before too long. And then, well, what other weapons were they using in the 18th century? Well, then you got to go get yourself a little knife like this here, Scottish Dirk. And then you're like, man, that's pretty cool, but uh, still, it'd be better if I actually got myself a full-fledged basket-hilted broadsword. Um, that's a little sneak peek to a video that is coming up here in the very near future. Okay, I'm just going to tell you guys, the Independence Day video is going to feature this right here in a little friendly competition. But then anyhow, I digress. Uh, it is a lot of fun, guys. It is a very, it's a very fun hobby. And then once you get all this stuff, then you start doing all your reading, and then you're picking up all these cool little historical things, and you figure out how things were working in history. Like, you ask your average person, well, why did people fight in wines? And the average person usually says, well, because they were stupid and it was about gentleman warfare and, and it's because the guns weren't accurate past 20 yards and all else sorts of stuff. And then you actually like realize, you start looking, well, why did they fight in wines? Oh, because that's the best way to maximize your firepower. And then people are like, well, they should have fought in the trees. Yeah, because every single battlefield you're going to come across is a heavily wooded forest, you know? it really starts to paint a better picture of what our forefathers went through to build this country. And that's probably one of the main reasons why I got into this hobby. So anyhow, that's part one of this series. There's going to be a video on cleaning. There's going to be a video on loading, making your own ammo, you know, all this, on all this sorts of stuff with these guns. So I hope you guys enjoy this. Once again, if you're watching this and you're new to flintlock shooting, welcome aboard. Enjoy the ride. It's about to be a lot of fun. So as always, guys, thank you for watching. Trust in God and keep your powder dry. Bye. In three, two, one. Um, um, I don't like being put on the spot like this because I don't know what to say. Caleb, you're going to open up the introduction. I don't know. I'm not. Oh, come on. No, 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 no. Open us up. Say, hello, I'm Caleb, and you're watching 11 Bang Bang. Hello, I'm Caleb, and you are watching 11 Bang Bang. We might put